Why were there so many young soldiers with gross evidence of coronary artery disease? Well, um, uh, you know, that's the study that I've talked about already in Korea, where they had uh, 80% of those average age 20 year olds at autopsy from battle uh, casualties already had gross evidence of disease you could see without a microscope. Yeah, those, uh, they were all eating uh, the Western, the Western diet. They were, uh, that, was, that study was confirmed, as I told you, 45 years later, looking at this time, young women and men between the ages of 17 to 34, and the disease now is ubiquitous. Yeah, it's the Western diet. Are lectins in plant-based foods a health concern? No, if you uh, if you if you uh, cook, that should not be an issue. Should we try to avoid add or avoid salt in our diet? How big a problem is salt? What health problems does it cause? Why do some people say we need salt? Yeah, I think that when you overdo salt, there I think the data are pretty clear about a tendency to have high blood pressure, hypertension. 1,500 milligrams is what's you, be the, usually the limit. Uh, uh, we personally do not cook with salt, but if you encounter something that seems a little bit tame or the food's a little flat, you get such little, when you use a salt, when you get so, using a salt shaker, you get so little that uh, that seems to be a safe way to get around that. Although, fortunately, many times, the food has such delightful taste, there'd be no need for it. Yeah. You're going to get all the sodium you need through the foods you're eating. What did Stan Hazen find in regards to lecithin and carnitine when ingested through food? What's the difference in those with carnivore diets and those with plant-based diets? Yeah, well, what Stan found was that in persons who are omnivores, uh, and whose diets contain lecithin and carnitine, they have in their gut bacteria that will convert the lecithin and carnitine into TMA, trimethylamine, and that will be rapidly oxidized by your liver to TMAO, trimethylamine oxide, and that is what injures blood vessels. When he did this study, not with patients who were omnivores, but were plant-based, gave them a lamb chop, check their blood for TMAO, no not there. So if you're plant-based, you're protected from having TMAO. And it's another reason why, and those who are pushing any kind of animal protein or meat, tell them, look, if you want to, you want to make TMAO and get heart disease, you eat the meat. What's been the response in the medical world to your studies showing how diet can dramatically reduce or eliminate heart disease? Well, the, the initial, obviously, it usually takes about between 17 and 20 years for some uh, new uh, idea or concept to get into the, the medical vernacular inter interim. Uh, the first study I think I mentioned since it was small, but we had absolutely striking results. And these patients who were they uh, failed their first or second bypass. They had failed their first or second angioplasty. They were too sick for these procedures or they had refused. And <clears throat> we just began to see this striking halting of any disease progression. And often we saw evidence of disease reversal. And, this, and these patients and the initial group were followed up uh, before I published them over 12 years which is almost half a career. It made it one of the longest studies in the medical literature on this type of approach. And yet, obviously, there are many people who are threatened. I mean, I'm an enormous threat to medicine's biggest cash cow. Just imagine if patients with heart disease, <clears throat> if they came in, instead of giving all these expensive pills, procedures which have high morbidity and mortality, like stents and bypass, and suddenly you could just heal them with Brussels sprouts and broccoli. You're going to offend a lot of people <laughs> and upset. So, you know, the criticisms are valid. We, our study was small, uh, all right? It wasn't randomized, right? And it was a very significant diet change. Many people said that we can't get our patients to eat that your diet. And uh, 
So uh, it was this same study, as I told you, was again repeated. And we, I went through that. We had 90% who were compliant. And literally, uh, there was no disease progression, except in one patient who didn't follow the, the program in those. So it was, uh, I want to be sure I'm answering the rest of this question. Ben, could you read that again? Yeah, just really what was the response from the whole medical world to... <laughs> What well, what mean? happened, and that was back in 1980s, early 90s, when we first did this. And uh, Ornish, same thing. But uh, what happened was, slowly, it has taken on. But for instance, I now am a member, of, a fellow of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. We started out with maybe four or 500 physicians, but went to 1,000 went to 2,000, went to 3,000, 5,000. Same thing is happening in the plantrician organization. All these physicians are fascinated and interested in plant-based nutrition. So really what you've got now is this groundswell of interest, enough so that even, here's how the, you see what's on the wall. You ever hear of Tyson, the food mannequin? But yeah, they are now figuring out a way to make a plant-based chicken. <laughs> Uh, or is it, or some, some, something so s similar? And there are other uh, uh, burgers that are appearing that are, uh, shall we say, uh, uh, mimicking something that is uh, plant based, but trying to make it taste like meat. So, anyway, there's no question that the, the tide is coming. And I think that. Well, once we can ever get the government to clean up its act and, and tell the American what is the safest diet, for instance, this, when the USDA makes a food pyramid for the American public every five years, if we can get, ever get them to take off the very foods that they always have on there, which when consumed will guarantee that millions of Americans will perish. When you can get a food plate for the public made basically from plants, there's going to be a hell of a day of reckoning as the chronic illness begins to disappear. How do we make sure we get enough minerals from our foods and how do we make sure we're not missing any key ones? Yeah, to, to do that, I did a little uh, more homework for you here. And if you'll bear with me, uh, this is going to be in the American Journal. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Yeah. The Journal of the American College of Cardiology. Fair enough? Yeah. This was, uh, sorry, I've got a little machine here that's making. Uh, this was uh, uh, authored by David Jenkins from Toronto with about 15 other authors. authors. And they looked at supplemental vitamins and minerals for cardiovascular disease prevention. And their conclusion was conclusive evidence for the benefit of supplements across different dietary backgrounds when the nutrient is sufficient has not been demonstrated. Okay, none. But what about vitamin D and calcium? Randomized controlled trials failed to demonstrate cardiovascular benefit with vitamin D supplementation. Right. And therefore, calcium supplementation should be used cautiously, striving for recommended intake of calcium predominantly from food sources. In this review, the authors examine the currently available evidence investigating whether vitamin D and calcium supplements are helpful, harmful, or neutral. So I think that if somebody is eating a spectrum of plant-based foods, just like Bill Connor looked at with the Tarahimara Indians who thrive on uh, uh, really beans, corn, and squash. They had no nutritional deficiencies. Your body knows how to extract these nutrients from food. 
Now, I will make one qual qualification. I'd like my patients to, do, to take B12. Which of these sources of information on health and nutrition do you trust? And which do you assume are biased because they've been financially influenced by big industry? The FDA, the USDA, the media, universities, scientific community, government agencies, politicians, clinical trials, medical journals. Again, who do you trust and who don't you trust because of perhaps uh, financial influence, uh, influential uh, well, they're all they're all at risk for really. Uh, I mean, I did uh, look up something else that I thought would be pertinent here. <clears throat> I don't know if you're familiar with Marcia Marcia Angel. She was for 20 years the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, perhaps the most prestigiously thought of scientific journal. And here's her comment. It is simply no longer possible to believe much of the clinical research that is published or to rely on the judgment of trusted physicians or authoritative medical guidelines. I take no pleasure in this conclusion, which I reached slowly and reluctantly over my two decades as an editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. I think that answers the question. Which nutritional supplements do you recommend everyone take? Vitamin B12. Do you recommend eating the new vegan burgers that are made from a variety of pea and similar proteins? Uh, ben, we just went over that. And uh, they're, 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 uh, you look at them and uh, the uh, Beyond Meat or something like that, loaded with oil, which you're going to injure, loaded with heme iron, yeah, that's, those, those things are all harmful. There's no studies on those showing that you can halt or arrest your disease. Yeah. There may be something coming down the line, but not yet. Why was it important for you to come speak here at the Real Truth About Health Conference? I wanted to simply have an opportunity to, uh, once again, share my kindred spirits with you and with uh, Steve Shore. And uh, it was an opportunity to update with, with my research and some of the clinical strategies we have for arresting and reversing heart disease. And I guess, is that the last question? Because I would simply say by, uh, finish by saying that here I am something like 21 years out of or having retired from a career in general surgery. And I find myself really uh, as passionate as ever about the field of medicine, because really I see in the future, hopefully the not too distant future, <clears throat> a seismic revolution in health. And the seismic revolution in health that is going to occur is not gonna come from the invention of another pill another drug, drug, another procedure, or another operation. The seismic revolution in health will occur when we in the profession have the will and the grit and the determination to share with the public what is the lifestyle and most specifically the nutritional literacy that will empower them as the, local, as the locus of control to absolutely annihilate chronic illness. Thank you. With that, thank you very much, Dr. Esselstein. We really, really appreciate it. And uh, good to see you again. Did we, uh, did we make the time cut off? <laughs> I, 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 think, I think we were exactly 90 minutes. <laughs> so, uh, again, thank you so, so very much for, for all of your work and for sharing it here with us and our audience. Uh, incredibly meaningful. And we, we right. really do appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. Carry on. Be well. Be well. Bye-bye. Right. Take care. Bye-bye.